This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. The Denver Nuggets, your 2023 NBA champions with their win over the Miami Heat in game number five and potentially another champion tonight in the NHL and another champion coming up on Sunday. The U.S. Open and PGA is coming up. It is at Los Angeles Country Club. Our job for today is to break down that event by talking to Brandon Gadula, getting his favorite bets over at FanDuel Sportsbook to get you ready for what should be another fun event this is covering the spread right here on the FanDuel podcast network and numberfire.com my name is Jim Sonis I am a senior writer and analyst for numberfire joined here as mentioned by Brandon Gadula check him out on Twitter at Gadula 13 he is the senior managing editor of numberfire.com Brandon the NBA finals have wrapped up uh no more sims for you to run there but uh have we gotten any more progress into convincing you talk WNBA on the show instead uh sometimes it's good to keep things more as hobbies than work so uh you have to do a little bit more more convincing there I could not disagree more I have no hobbies that do not correlate to my work because I'm a boring human um just because I enjoy my work primarily that's the main driver there any final thoughts for you on the NBA finals based on what we saw across those five thrilling games yeah, uh, the Nuggets are a very good team. Um, <laughs> Miami, I don't know if Jimmy Butler just got worn out or what, mm-hmm. but he refused to shoot the ball in game five. It was uh, very, very frustrating. Um, I know uh, Jeff Van Gundy was talking about it during the broadcast, put a lot of pressure on the role players to yeah. just sort of create shots. I also kind of think that Miami's – offensive schemes just didn't really lead to a whole lot so yeah. i mean congrats to the nuggets they deserved a win um you know uh, it was fun to track miami but it's one of those situations where sometimes the underdog story is fun to root for until yeah. it's not and then it's like uh, maybe if we had like boston or philly or you know another team to give denver a, a run that could have been cool but uh you know it is what it is and we're on to next season yeah, the Jimmy stuff was weird to the point where at the end of the game, I was shocked when he did shoot. Like he made yeah. those back to back threes on those. I bo- I expect him to pass on both those because of the way it had been going to that point. Again, I'm not a huge NBA observer, but like it was definitely odd. Um, I can't blame him based on <laughs> the burden he carried based on having an ankle sprain as well. Um, but, you know, yeah. it was it- fun to educate my wife on the nikola Jokic as a child pictures i think yeah. that made it all worth it showing her those showing her the taco bell commercial that ran when he was drafted which made me want a quesarito pretty badly um but you know congrats to the nuggets as you said uh, a, and we'll see what happens next year too it's also one of those like you can't you can't knock jimmy because they wouldn't yeah. have been there without him and then it just goes back to like the the LeBron situation where people cite how many losses he has in the finals. And it's like, in some realities, not making the NBA finals is better than losing in the NBA finals. So I just, right. You know, is it better to struggle in game five of the NBA finals or to observe from your couch as you've been sitting there for a couple months without making the playoffs? Who can say? Not I, not I. We're going to dive on into this U.S. Open. Uh, outline a course we have not seen on the PGA Tour before, I guess, or on, in a major before. Outline what to know about that and Brandon's favorite bets over at FanDuel Sportsbook. But first, a reminder to make sure you are subscribed to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts. If you want some thoughts on Game 5 in the NHL for tonight, we did talk to Austin Swain about that yesterday. There's a timestamp for that in the episode over on uh, wherever you get your podcast, the episode description will have a timestamp for that. If you want to skip ahead to the NHL game five discussion between the Panthers and the Golden Knights, get that wherever you get your podcast. Also check us out over on the FanDuel YouTube page. If you like what you hear, leave us a thumbs up on YouTube or a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts or on Spotify. Are you looking to have a stake in the U.S. Open all weekend long? Well, FanDuel has you covered with the PGA Eagle Daily Fantasy Contest, which is now live. Test your 
knowledge of the PGA Tour by putting together a six-person lineup while staying under the salary cap and using FanDuel's live scoring feature. Follow along as you compete for a share of $350,000 with first place taking home $100K all for just a $9 entry fee. Whether it's household names like Scotty Scheffler and Brooks Kepka or your favorite underdog, they tee off on Thursday. Plenty of options to fill out a lineup as you compete for first place. Thursday will be here before you know it. So submit your lineups on FanDuel today. Eligibility restrictions apply. Go to FanDuel.com or download the FanDuel app for more details. Let's dig in now to the U.S. Open brand talking here first about the course. It is at Los Angeles Country Club, the first time it has hosted a PGA Tour event. It has been the host of a couple of uh, three USGA events. I don't know anything about those, but maybe you do. Uh, so what should we know about the course Los Angeles CC based on yardage, based on uh, research you've done, we can apply to this year's field? Yeah, so the one you'll probably hear cited a decent amount is the 2017 Walker Cup. Um, which is it, it's it's the U.S. versus um, Great Britain and Ireland, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, Team Great Britain and Ireland. Um, and the only relevant players who are in the field, and by, I mean relevant, I just mean like the only players in the field who actually played uh, there were Colin Morikawa and the favorite uh, Scotty Scheffler, which I think might be. <laughs> I don't think we need more reasons to like Scotty Scheffler, but the fact that, you know, he has that, I guess, six years ago, he played here in a team. Hey, we're from Matt Fitzpatrick last year <laughs> at the U S yeah. open. Yeah. It's, it's one of those situations, but yeah, we're not working with a whole lot of like tangible knowledge um, about LACC. We know it's a long par 70. Uh, so scores are going to be high or low or, I, I view it as high. Um, I think most people do, but point being, it's going to play tough relative to par, which is typical for a U.S. Open. The past three winners of U.S. Opens have all been six under par, and I think it was 13 under uh, when it was at Pebble Beach, and then maybe one under. But uh, yeah, it, it's you know it's going to be tough. True birdies are going to be hard to you know, hard to find. So all that's really going to do is change the. Uh, the amount of fantasy points we get for our DFS lineups. It's all the same for, for all the golfers. Um, this course starts out with basically two par four and a half. So it's going to be a scoreable par five. So if you guys are starting off on, on the first, you're going to want to see a birdie there, but they might give it right back um, on the second. And I think that's just kind of the way that this course might play. It's, it's some gettable holes, but a lot of, you know, a lot of ways to get into some sort of trouble. I mean, it looks like a really cool golf course. There's undulating fairways, which is always intriguing. Uh, so placement off the tee, probably going to matter. Uh, but it also might be one of those where if you put it three yards left or right of the target that you're aiming for, could be in trouble. That could frustrate some golfers. That's also something that specifically at U.S. Opens, I think we need to, to keep in mind is that some of these guys – might get a little bit uh, flustered with the setup. Um, so maybe, you know, if that's the kind of narratives that you like to play, go for it. But the obvious, uh, the two obvious names there uh, being John Rahm and Tyrrell Hatton, both in really good shape this week. So I'm not going to uh, play that angle because I like both um, for this week. But if you go up with a hole by hole breakdown of the course based on the scorecard that's up on the, the U.S. Open website and compare each hole to the average of the same par. We're getting 10 of 18 holes that are at least 10% longer than the average hole of that, that same par. So you can look at overall distance always. That's like the easiest thing to do, but 10 holes are like noticeably longer uh, than, you know, a usual par four, par five, that, that kind of thing. And um, there's some long, long par threes. Two of them are over 280 yards. Uh, six par fours, at least 480. There's a, a par five that can play like 625. So it's going to be, I mean, and I have this all up in an article on number fire. If you want to check it out, um, kind of get some context, but you know, I'm seeing some conflicting reports or, uh, you know, analysis on how important driving distance is going to be at this setup. Uh, I think it's going to matter because it's just the amount of holes where it, where it's, you know, going to play long. Um, mm. 
accuracy, I think is going to matter, but yeah, it's, it's kind of wide open. So you don't have to be super precise, but I think that if you're, if you're really short off the tee, you're gonna have a hard time. So, you know, it's a lot of guesswork, um, a lot of flyovers. There's a lot of good content out there on the course. Um, Golf Digest has a good uh, overview. The, the U.S. Open website itself has some like virtual flyovers of everything. So you can really get a feel um, for how this thing's going to play. Um, and, and I think the one thing that we need to factor in here is there's a lot of those dry riverbeds. Um, it's going to be, you know, it's going to be tough whenever you miss in the wrong spots. And I think that it might just be, you know, the guys who don't have those one or two blow up holes that ultimately emerge. But that's kind of what we're looking at this week. Now, you discussed how there are multiple ways to view distance, given that placement should matter, but also they're really long holes. And that introduces more variance into the discussion. Mm -hmm. So I want to ask you, like, a, from a process perspective, do you tend to play things differently when there are unknowns like we have for this week? Like, are you less willing to make bets than you typically would be because there's more variance there need a bigger edge versus the market. How do you kind of handle things in situations like this? Yeah. So, uh, I mean, a small part of my process is factoring in um, estimated course fit uh, to, you know, alter what stroke scanned inputs I'm, I'm putting in to my model before running it. Um, so obviously harder to do that this week because we don't know, what actually has mattered here statistically. And that's how I view things rather than just, you know, assumptions this week, we have to make those assumptions or we just run it without any assumptions at all. And I tried my best to, to have some assumptions, but sort of on the low end. Um, so not, not any big, big swings here, because I, I do think that all types of players can play well here in theory. I just think that the bigger hitters are going to have more of an advantage, which is almost always the case anyway. Um, but, you know, typically when we get a first time course, I am a little more timid to dive in. But if anyone's ever listened to the show, they know that I'm a little more conservative, uh, you know, that, than, than some others might be. That being said, we know U.S. Opens are tough. We know that mm -hmm. they're long. We know that they rotate courses. We know that at majors, the best players tend to separate. So it's not like I'm treating it just like, hey, there's this new course kind of a weak field on the PGA tour, don't really know what to expect. Um, so I'm a little bit more, you know, I'm a little bit above that level of, of like skepticism in, in the way that I'm viewing things. And again, specifically, I feel like at us opens because of how tough they are um, the best rise to the top, the past winners at us opens, Matt Fitzpatrick. Great. You know, we know he's a great player. Uh, best John golfer Rahm, in the world. I agree. Yeah, right. Yeah. If anyone's, yeah, not watching Jim's wearing a, a nice Northwestern hat, which he for claims that specific reason. Matt Fitzpatrick, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so Fitzpatrick, John Rahm, Bryson DeChambeau, Gary Woodland, Brooks Kepka twice, Dustin Johnson, Jordan Spieth, the past U.S. Open winners, and the name that might jump out there is Gary Woodland. But entering, he had a 50 round moving average according to Data Golf of about 1.3 strokes gained per round adjusted for field strength. For context, this year, that's like Justin Thomas or Cam Young, two guys who would not shock, like truly shock. Are they golfing their best? No. But again, it's it's U.S. Open. Um, I think it's pretty clear that overall game is going to separate more than trying to nail the right proximity um, ranges uh, for this week. So that's basically how I've been working uh, with things for about probably like two years now, not trying to get too too detailed with the stats I'm looking at. So I feel pretty good, all things considered, for this week. So you want guys in great overall form. I think <laughs> the headliner there is Scotty Scheffler. It's pretty obvious. He's 7-1 to one to win a FanDuel Sportsbook, and he is there despite the fact his putting has been iffy. So does that prevent Scheffler from being a value for you at 7-1? to one? And what's your view of the rest of the favorites at FanDuel Sportsbook right now? So the way that my model works is I just take – round by round scoring and do some adjustments from there for field strength, uh, recency, whatever else um, that, that goes in there. So it doesn't necessarily factor out putting. It doesn't necessarily bump guys up for better tee to green or ball striking numbers, anything like that. Cause I like to take uh, samples for multiple tours and we just don't have the reliable data from, from other tours. So again, I don't factor out putting. So for Scheffler, all of his putting, we'll call them woes are factored in, but in theory, I'm using a long enough sample where things smooth out um, long-term. Now, I've also done some research on 
putting. And the reason that I feel pretty good about not trying to make a more tee to green based model is that we can actually, you know, first of all, putting stats, they're not random and they will stabilize over time. So by using a large sample kind of just, you know, compensates for, for the fact that putting does uh, sort of ebb and flow, but we also can look specifically at more or less putting from within 15 feet. That's the most predictive range. If you had to pick one range, it'd be like five to 10 feet. It's a good sample of putts um, that are makeable and they separate out the best golfers. But if you look at putting stats from within 15 feet, Scheffler's a 24th percentile this season from within 15 feet. That is the main concern. That being said, it's not like he's dreadful and can never make a putt. We know that mm-hmm. that's not how putting works. And especially with Scheffler, um, he, he can definitely look like he's never going to miss similar to like, like a Brooks Kapka in major. It feels like he's never missing an eight footer, but you know, if he does putt well, he can win this thing by multiple shots. That's how good the T to green game is. Uh, but mathematically speaking, whenever you like simulate stuff out, if you use individual player uh, deviations, he's it's it's a low standard deviation because he's so consistent with the tee to green game. But the putting has not really spiked in a positive sense. Hasn't I mean it's been kind of down very recently, but it's not like he's losing ten shots uh, putting every single round. He um, tried at the <laughs> memorial. He tried. He tried, but that that's like an outlier. Yeah. Um, so he has a really high floor. And so just mathematically, um, John Rom, for example, is a more volatile player than Scotty Scheffler. Mm-hmm. All of that being said, I have his win odds, his expected win odds at plus 720. So when he was plus 750, I thought he was fine. Frankly, I'm not going to fight anyone who wants to bet him at plus 700. That's, again, you can rerun the simulations over 10,000 times and he might be plus 700 exactly, whatever. Um, so for me, Scheffler's fine. His T to green game is so dominant right now that all he has to do is putt. Okay. And he realistically could win. And if he hits a, a few long putts, this could be Scotty Scheffler's uh, major to lose. And if you have like a boost offered to you on sure. someone in the field, Scheffler seems like the prime candidate because the difference between like seven to one and nine to one, if it's like a plus 200 boost, like that's yeah. a big difference in implied odds. So yeah. and he'd be the first guy I would think about there too. And seven to one is looking like a light, uh, a nice uh, number too. I would just say that much compared to some other, you know, not surprised, you know, not surprised by any means. So Scheffler, not quite a value by your numbers. Is there anybody who is a value, any outrights you like for this week at FanDuel right now? Yeah, I like two guys. Um, John Rahm at 11 to 1 and Xander Schauffele at 19 to 1. I'm sorry, but no one can really build a case against Xander that I will hear. Um, And just, you know, often analysis around major time is, well, I don't like to bet guys who haven't won a major. It's like, oh, how do you win a major? It, like it, it's not like only people who've won a major can win a major. It's right. just not how it works. Um, so I, I always find that I'm um, a bit funny, but with Rom, like it's starting to feel like he's a bit, a bit forgotten based mm-hmm. on how good Scheffler has been. Um, Rom is not very far removed from winning every tournament he played in. So like, it, it's just kind of crazy uh, where he is now. He's a great putter overall. Um, but he's second in the field in strokes gained ball striking over the past 50 rounds, according to data golf. If you remove the small samples for the live tour guys right now, um, that being said, he is like nearly a full shot worse in ball striking, which is strokes gained off the tee and strokes gained approach than Scotty Scheffler. So again, Scheffler is like that good right now with his driver and his irons, which is why he's uh, deservedly the favorite. But um, Rom is, Second in that department, and he has great underlying putting stats. He's a 70th percentile uh, putter from within 15 feet. I don't really know how you make a case against John Rahm, other than the fact that he's not Scotty Scheffler, but it's a, you know, long term, their strokes gain numbers are almost identical, and I'm getting a much better number on John Rahm. It's put together, packaged a little bit differently because Rahm's a little bit worse with the ball striking. Um, and a lot better with the putter, but I mean, I'll, I'll take the, I'll, I'll take it. It's different routes to the same destination, basically. Uh, with yeah. 
And it's like, would, would it surprise anyone if John Rom had a better tee to green week than Scotty Scheffler? No. Yeah. Like, and, and, and honestly, like the thing with my model is it basically just says, here's how good guys have been. I make some adjustments for what, how the course might play that week. And then it says, here's where guys probably should be. And it's a reminder that John Rom is not an afterthought. Yeah. And I'm not saying he's an afterthought because he's, you know, second on the, like I get, I'm not, I'm not trying to make it sound like he's 50 to one, but they're very similar. And I'd rather just take the better number on John Rom. Let's talk about Xander now. Uh, Xander Shoffle, as you mentioned, 19 to one at FanDuel. That number is shortened throughout the week. Where yeah. is the point where you back off? Um, Cause it's been pretty steady 19 to one. I think that it's held there and it probably will be there when people listen to this show. But um how much more value is there to squeeze out of Shoffley at his current number? Um, so I have him specifically. Let's see here. I have him at seventeen to one. Okay, so there's still a decent amount of wiggle room there yeah. on Shoffley to still be a value. Um, yeah. What puts him up there for you? Is it just like the overall form being sick uh, that kind of puts Shoffley in play for you? So yeah, I mean, a lot of it has to do with I just. Uh, you know, again, I don't always just agree with the model, um, but the model is here to tell me who's good at golf and how often they should win this particular tournament against this particular field. And then I just go from there and make my own decisions. But Xander, five straight top 18s at majors, six straight top 25s in his stroke play events entering. And he's a top five iron player in the field over the past 50 rounds, according to data golf, which is one of the things that, has always kind of had Xander a step below the superstars was the iron play. Now he's really, really up there. And it just is going to be a matter of when he puts it all together in the same week. Um, you know, we get the, the California narrative, although I will say um, just kind of a, a, a small caveat to that uh, California narrative. A lot of the California courses are POA greens this week. It's bent grass, just something, um, to, to throw in there, but I would be willing to hear any arguments against Sander other than the fact that he shrinks in the moment. Cause I don't think that's the case. I think he just has had a lot of bad variants on his end. Um, and you know, he won a gold he, medal. You can't say he shrinks. I think he's a really, I mean, eventually it's going to go his way. Yeah, I agree. Y- yeah. If you put yourself in top 15, top 20 contention, all it's going to take is a few more putts, one right. more break going your way. And I don't I don't think people realize sometimes how much that impacts who wins a golf tournament. Right. So the outrights Brandon likes here, John Rom 11 to 1, Xander Schauffele 19 to 1. You said it's not really a week for for long shots. Anyone you like there or fully avoiding those and sticking with Rom and Xander? There so I'm going to go with basically heavy at Rom and Xander yeah. uh, and then the other markets, but three other names showing fair value. Uh, that I think are noteworthy. Um, Tony Finau at 37, Jason Day at 50, and then our guy, Wyndham Clark, 85 to 1. Big hitter, great game right now. Uh, I'm fine with with Clark at, at a top 10, um, which we'll get into here in a second. But those three names, uh, I think, are worth monitoring. And I will, I'll be fine to put some partial units on those. But if I was really telling anyone uh, anything, I'm focused on Rom and Xander this week, I think. Uh, I usually wait till I talk to you to place bets outside of three balls because I just yeah. take whatever data golf says as a value there. Uh, I did make two like gut bets this week. One is Wyndham to win. <laughs> the other one, I don't know if I want to disclose to you because I'm a little bit ashamed about it, but you know. Um, is it to win? Yeah, I mean, I did slack you about this person so you can guess it, but. Uh, Sheffler just moved to plus 650. Oh, well, alas. <laughs> Wasn't a value at seven to one anyway. If you look uh, at the screen, you can see who I uh, am referencing, but it's Mito Pereira. Oh, geez. I, I mean, know. I see the I case know. for it, but I know. Can you though? Or are you just making me feel better about myself? I mean, great. This ball is striker. a this is a do as I say, not as I do situation. I should be so clear this about is, that. I'm not so recommending what, Wyndham and Mito, but you. This is this is one of those things though. If if Mito closed out the PGA, he, everyone would view him differently in majors. That yeah. one hole changes like, oh, he'd be a major champion. And like to a lot well, of he people, will that be would... after Sunday. But... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I, I just think that um, we sometimes we need to be a little bit more. 
little fairer in the first time. I think we'll. I don't think it would be shocking if we got a first time winner, first time major winner this week due to the course. But yeah, I mean, between Wyndham and Mito, there's like sixty <laughs> yeah, percent sure. odds that happens. Yeah. So you know, I agree. Um, what about the non outrights? Anything stand out to you there? Well, Wyndham Clark has. I mean, you know, if people are listening in, um, maybe his top ten odds have, have shortened drastically. But he was plus seven hundred to top ten. Oh. Um, which is a really good number on FanDuel Sportsbook. Uh, Brooks just shortened. There you go. Someone heard Brooks. So, But again, really? Clark is phenomenal right now. He is 13th in the field. This this field, which is you know a major field, uh, in true strokes gained over the past 50 rounds, according to Data Golf, he is 16th in distance, 35th in putting. He's really one of the best golfers in the field sort of in the world right now. Um, and it's a really, really good uh, numbers, like good numbers for him, you know, in, in any market, whether that's outright, which I love the optimism uh, top 10, though, still really good. I have him around plus five fifty to top 10 uh, this week. And then basically just some, uh, I love majors cause we always get the, yeah. the props yeah. and we get the, the nationality props. I just love those because they're such natural groups. And I hate trying to f- go from like, here's the groups of like four to six names. And then I'm like putting them in my spreadsheet and I'm like, who, all right, who's in this, this one, it's so much easier and so much more fun. Yeah. Um, but top Englishman, Tyrrell Hatton plus 280. I love Tyrrell Hatton right now. Um, I think we're getting a little bit of past winner. <laughs> see, see scroll. <laughs> it's just way at the bottom. I don't know <laughs> it's if it's alphabetical order. I couldn't figure it out, but I got there eventually. Um, I think Matt Fitzpatrick in this market is a little bit overvalued due to having won last year. I do fear Justin Rose a bit. We're, we're on team Rose right now. Um, we've been, we've been all over team Rose, but I don't think either of us have anything bad to say about Tiro Hatton really has no shortcomings in uh, his profile. He's a plus in all four. Uh, Strokes game category is just so good right now across the board. I'm seeing value uh, in this market. Just below that, I I believe it should be. Um, Thank you for the guidance. (laughs) Top Swede. Mm -hmm. uh, Vincent Norman, plus Mm -hmm. 200. Uh, Big hitter, sort of a, I don't want to be dismissive, but kind of a, a head-to-head against Alex Noren, who I don't think is a great course fit necessarily, unless short game is really what ultimately matters here. Um, and then last one, I think, is at the very bottom. Top lefty. Oh. Yeah. Like Not that. a nationality, but Brian Harmon. Uh, he is the favorite at minus 120. Uh, he's just versus Phil Mickelson and Hank Libiota. We like Hank uh, plenty, but Brian Harmon's a really good golfer. Uh, my model show and value on uh, Brian Harmon in that market pretty clearly. So I feel good with uh, with those ones. And Harmon is a guy who can gain strokes off the tee despite not being long. And I think that's typically pretty valuable, especially for an event like this where it may be long, but he can place it well and stuff like that. So I think that, yeah. you know, archetype might not be there but he's overcome that everywhere else so i think that makes sense for him yeah and i don't know if the archetype's necessarily there for phil yeah (laughs) although i've been we something we didn't talk about with the whole golf news is that it's happening right before the u.s open yeah and that's the one phil needs so I think phil's been feeling himself so the confidence will not be low (laughs) coming into this event (laughs) We can say yeah. that based on his Twitter activity. I feel like he's feeling himself quite a bit. So, yeah. you know, there's that at least. Okay. So the non outrights, Brandon likes Wyndham Clark, top 10, seven to one Tyrrell Hatton, top Englishman plus two eighty. Vince Norman, top suite at two to one. And then a top lefty Brian Harmon at minus one twenty. Any final thoughts, Brandon, before we close up shop and send off everyone to fill out their bet slips for this week? Uh, you know, it's a major, a lot of, a lot of good names. Um, at the top, if you have a if you have a strong suspicion, if you like what you're seeing from certain golfers, you know I, I really can't talk you out of almost anyone at the top of the board. But I know it's fun to bet the long shots. I'm sure 
people tuning in or just trying to get some some extra action because it's a major. Uh, just look at who wins majors and and try to protect yourself a little bit. I don't want to talk anyone out of like hitting a long shot, but I think this week especially is going to be. There's so many guys in good form right now that yeah, for one of the long shots that float to the top, I would be astonished. So um, it's I don't tough to know. top when there's a list of Scotty Scheffler, John Rom, Wyndham Clark, Mita Pereira. It's tough to top all four of those guys. So yeah. I get why you're wary of the long shots. Yeah, I haven't. Uh, I haven't seen if uh, field. Oh wait, here it is: Big Guns versus the Field. Okay, Brooks, John Rom, Rory, and Scheffler plus two thirty-five versus the Field. Okay, I'd rather just bet Mito outright. <laughs> Again, this is not on Brandon. This is on me, and this is not a recommendation. This is me being dumb, and I want to be fully transparent about that. So. Do as I say, not as I do. Check out Brandon on Twitter at Cadula13. As he mentioned, all of the simulations are up over on numberfire.com. He went through the course data there as well. Find that over at numberfire.com. Find his work there. We'll also talk about uh, the DFS side of things over on the FanDuel YouTube page, noon Eastern on Tuesday, and then up on the Numberfire Daily Fantasy Podcast feed after that. Brandon, thank you for swinging by for today as always, and I'll talk to you again in less than one hour. Sounds good. Looking forward to talking more golf. All righty. F- Fine brand on Twitter. I could do a 13. I am on Twitter at Jim Sonis. Want to thank you all for tuning in for today. Good luck to you with your bets for the U.S. Open and for game five between Vegas and Florida. We'll talk to you once again tomorrow. This has been covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. 